We're pleased to welcome Dr. Randy Wymore. Good morning. So I just wanted to say that yesterday all the clinicians gave uh, fascinating talks. However, let's see, uh, no sugar, no caffeine, no alcohol, no gluten, no wheat. I've heard no chocolate. I, th that has eliminated 95% of my diet. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to uh, take you on sort of the uh, journey of how I have approached Morgellons disease. Uh, from the very beginning, and in some ways it's, it's interesting because uh, what uh, Marianne des described yesterday as sort of the two possibilities, that's what I started with basically. That it's either a psychiatric disorder, that is to say no, bi no biological entities, no causative agents, it's purely delusional, or Morgellons is a condition associated with some microbial agents, maybe just one, maybe several different ones. And that if there are psychiatric symptoms, it's a consequence of the, con the, the infection rather than uh, a purely psychiatric disorder. So, okay, if we're going biological, what are the, the possibilities? Viruses, fungi, filarial worms, arthropods, bacteria, sort of the usual, uh, usual suspects for many different things. So I thought viruses did not seem to be particularly likely. Either that or it was just me with wishful thinking because I'm not a virologist and that's a lot harder to study. So when I first saw the fibers, uh, pictures of them, and then looked in the microscope myself, uh, which I had to borrow one because molecular biologists don't use microscopes, I thought, well, you know, uh, maybe this is some sort of fungal hyphae. So that's what I started with, was thinking, hmm, maybe fungi. So here's the thing. If, in fact, there is some causative agent, we'll just say microbial, not knowing what kind it is, there are two things. It needs to be present in everyone who's got Morgellons and also not present in the background population, that is to say the uh, unaffected negative control. So both of those things, that seemed initially, I hate to say easy, but yeah, kind of easy in my mind. It's like, oh, well, we'll just identify what's different between, between uh, my negative controls and the Morgellon samples. So for all of this I'm gonna show you, this is the basic, uh, um, materials and methods, what was done, basically samples were obtained. We would extract the DNA from whatever the sample happened to be, do uh, PCR to amplify uh, suspect pieces of DNA, if they're there. Then we run it out on a gel. If there's a band visible, cut the band out, send it off to uh, OSU Stillwater where there's a core facility for sequencing get the sequence back, and then run it through the NCBI BLAST to identify what those sequences were. And that's what was done for all of this. So keep in mind that the first number of years, what I basically was involved in is what uh, demonstrating what Morgellons is not. And that involved many thousands of hours of, uh, of works. So for the fungal types, these are the results that we had. And remember, I'm looking for something that's present in the Morgellons population that's not in the negative controls. Well, up front, we got Candida albicans, uh, Trichophyton. Notice 100%, every sample had, had the uh, Candida present in it. And anyway, going down through, uh, why did I do mushrooms? Because there was a, a lot of chatter on the internet about how this is some sort of spore and it's, there were warnings, don't eat mushrooms from your local store because that can give you more gallons. And so at any rate, I went ahead and looked. Yeah, just for the record, I didn't find any in the controls or the more gallon samples. So these slight differences, for instance, the 64% uh, for the skin and nail fungal uh, um, uh, fungi, 
that's, that's not enough of a difference to be suggestive of anything infective. And in fact, you have just the reverse down here with the Ascomycota, where there's actually slightly more in the negative control population. And if, if you look, when you say, well, some people say, well, wh what if it's just a subspecies or some variety of that? So the primers I used to do the PCR, for instance, uh, with the Ascomycota, that would have picked up any one of the 64,000 species, and, and ones that haven't even been identified yet, probably. Microsporidia, about a million of them. So this is not something that would have been uh, lurking in there in that variety. Of course, then I, people said, well, yeah, skin's not the place to look. Uh, look in the mouth. That's, that's do, do cheek swabs. And so I know for a fact there are a couple people in this room who uh, sent me Q-tips of, of mouth swabs. Uh, but I won't say what states they're from. And uh, at any rate, I got a number of those from um, multiple different states across the country. And once again, we have just sort of this close uh, variability, but 62% for Morgellons, again for Candida, versus 50 in the negative control, slightly more for the Ascomycota, 14 in the negative controls, and only 12 in there, and then zero across the board for, for all of the others. So basically, after using this variety of primers that would have picked up uh, basically almost any fungal form there is, I thought, no, that's, it's not hyphae. It's not fungal forms whatsoever. And by the way, for those of you who are microbiologists, uh, you know, bear with me on my pronunciation of some of these things because I don't consider myself particularly good at uh, those uh, bacteria or fungal forms. So then the next thing I wanted to look at was actual parasitic uh, and even some non-parasitic organisms because uh, there was a lot of talk about how well these things mutate. <coughs> They've developed the ability to infect humans. And so once again, we're just looking at the, uh, this, instead, this time instead of percentage, it's the number of samples that we looked at. And so we screened for Calembola. Uh, springtails, scabies mites, roundworms, flatworms, and even cyanobacteria, uh, and, and later on archaea, just to show that uh, some of the things that are in the environment that had been purported are probably not good candidates. So for Calembola, uh, 24 samples, uh, different samples from uh, different locations were looked at, never found in Morgellon samples, never found in the control population. However, in the environment, did my primers work? Was the PCR just failing? No, things were working great. I didn't even have to extract the DNA to amplify the Calembola uh, from the environment. I got some moldy leaves, crunched them up with my hand, swished them around in some water, and used a couple microliters of that water to PCR. And as you can see, four out of five samples that I took, I was able to amplify it. So it's really easy to amplify Calembola. It's not found in Morgellons samples whatsoever. Uh, same with scabies mites. We had some positive controlled DNA. I never could get that from the environment. Uh, roundworms I actually did. I think probably a dog had pooped in the grass, and so I was able to get some roundworms from, um, from that, along with the flatworms, uh, but not found in the Morgellons or negative control uh, populations. Same with cyanobacteria. You know, there's some. Uh, Oh, uh, conditions affecting fish that causes lesions on the, on the fish and ulcerations. Uh, one type of cyanobacteria has been implicated in that, and so hmm, it's worth looking. No, it's not that. I won't go over every single one of these. Mosquitoes, flies, Drosophila, the fruit fly, uh, scabies mites, chiggers, ticks. Because there was some talk about, well, maybe ticks are actually somehow getting into the skin or leaving their head behind, and that's what's uh, moving and causing the problems. So the, the ones I have, though, in red, I wanted to uh, point out to you. Uh, dust mites, would you expect them to be found on most people? If you sleep in a bed and, and happen to not take a shower right afterwards or have your head on a pillow, Yep, and so in fact, was present in Morgellon samples, present in the negative control population, present in the environment. Uh, Demodex, a, a small 
little creature found in uh, down around eyelashes and in other locations, again found in Morgellons samples and the negative control population and the environment. Um, filarial worms were something that because, you know, some of the really tiny filarial worms, could those be candidates somehow? Not that the Morgellons fibers ever looked like anything even faintly resembling a uh, living organism, but um, no, uh, filarial worms were not present in Morgellons. I did actually find one person who had a filarial worm DNA um, in the negative control population, which was kind of uh, uh, interesting. Uh, easy to amplify from the environment. Archaea was found in um, uh, it's a, kind of its own unique uh, a variety of uh, microorganism found in Morgellon samples and the negative control and the environment. <clears throat> I PCR'd that from water from a, a lake in, in Oklahoma. So the point of this is mostly not what was found, but what was not found there, including all of the, oh, and by the way, when I say I have the specific names there, Drosophila melanogaster fruit, fr fruit fly, but the primers would have amplified any uh, of the Drosophilas. And same with the mites, the chiggers, uh, the filarial worms, the tapeworms, the, the flatworms, any variety, regardless of the size, found on any continent, and even ones undiscovered, undoubtedly. Uh, so, Columbula, do you know how many species of Columbula there are? Uh, springtails. Well, back in 1997, there were 6,500 species. The number now is up, to, uh, I've heard, uh, somewhere in, in the, the ten, oh, tens of thousands, around 19,000 or so. And so, it's, again, it's not a case of, well, you just didn't detect them. It's a new species. It's a new variety of that. No, we could detect it from uh, any of those. Unless they've mutated so far, then they would no longer be a, a member of that. And then moving on to bacteria. Uh, S. epidermidis, 85% uh, from Morgellons, 100% from the control population. And just going through Staph aureus, E. coli, and, and so forth, all these were uh, ones that were worth looking at. And because uh, the Staph uh, epidermidis is so prevalent, that became my positive control for punch biopsies and skin samples. If I couldn't amplify it from that, I would just treat that as not a good sample, that the DNA was uh, um, not useful for that purpose. And so every one of the samples that I'm going to show you shortly, there was a positive control that had that amplified and uh, DNA was amplified to show that it was, it was working. So at any rate, again, a lot of these are found in, in humans. Um, uh, flipping back and forth between uh, who has the most, whether it's in a, the Morgellons population or the negative control population. Um, strep pyogenes was one that had been talked about at one point. Uh, Pseudomonas also. Yeah, there, this is not numbers of times found. This is percent of the total samples that we did of all of this. So finding it in 2% of the Morgellons population that's not what I was looking for. I was looking for something that was there most of the time. Nicardia, the reason I wanted to check that is because it makes a filamentous structure. Even though it's bacterial, it, it actually, uh, uh, under really low power of a microscope, it can kind of look like a, a fungal form, almost like a, a, a strange hyphae. Uh, and it uh, forms a biofilm, uh, but again, it's just 2% didn't find it in the background population at all. Now this one is particularly, I, I'd like you to, to think about this one for a minute. Agrobacterium. Agrobacterium is the organism that is used for make, doing transgenic plants, uh, the, the GMO plants. Agrobacterium has the ability to transfer DNA from one, one plant to another and even uh, to, to one type of insect. Not sure how far beyond that uh, it can go, but it's used for specifically for, for that purpose. It's also found widely in the environment. So, in this case, I'm presenting it as uh, the total number of samples that were looked at and the, the number of uh, positives that showed up for them. Well, three of eight Morgellon samples had 
agrobacterium DNA, this is from skin swabs, uh, control population three of six. The soil, I got it 100% of the time. And then I also have a, an oak tree with a huge oak tumor. Uh, you've maybe heard of uh, uh, galls, uh, root galls, uh, oak galls, uh, lots of other trees get these tumors. And it's caused by, by agrobacterium inserting DNA and basically it's causing it to grow wild, out of control, much like a tumor in, in a human. So uh, again, really easy to PCR from that oak tumor. I just went and took uh, a nail and scraped a little bit of the bark off. I uh, actually did a DNA extraction from it, but I did that at f on five different oaks and, uh, sorry, six different oaks and five of the six I was able to amplify the DNA. And that'll become important in a, in a moment, not so much for here. Uh, but at any rate, now I did also fibers versus skin swabs. The reason it's fibers versus skin swabs, well, there are no fibers in the negative control population, so I had to have something to use to, to compare to it. So that's why those numbers are the same for the, 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 uh, ne uh, the control population from top to bottom. Uh, and then uh, mouth and uh, cheek swabs, uh, one of six did have it in the control population, one of eight in the Morgellons population. Now here's the thing with agrobacterium. This is genomic DNA. So this is what determines that it's agrobacterium. It has the um, coding DNA for all of the proteins, all of the structural, structural proteins, uh, uh, ribosomes, and so forth. But that genomic DNA does not have the ability to transfer DNA from one species of plant to another. There is something called the TI plasmid. Uh, plasmids were mentioned yesterday. It's a very small circular strand of DNA that is separate from the genomic DNA. In fact, uh, you know, any, any given bacterium will only have one copy of genomic DNA, but it can have many copies of the plasmids. And it can transfer that plasmid to other, um, other uh, of the same species. It can sometimes cross species and that TI plasmid is what's used to do make the transgenic plants. So the key there is if it's agrobacterium without that plasmid, it's just a regular old bacterial strain that can't do anything. So when I look specifically for that TI plasmid, suddenly the numbers fall to zero. Zero out of eight in the Morgellons samples, zero out of six in the control population, uh, one out of four in the soil, and in the oak tumors, still five out of six. So the oak tumors DNA had not only the genomic DNA from the previous slide, but also that TI plasmid, and that's why that tumor was forming, because it was present. I, I say that because that's uh, one of the controls to show that this reaction actually did work. We also had uh, DNA that w we purchased, and it, all of those worked. Uh, that was skin swabs, same with fibers not found in the control population, not found in Morgellon samples, cheek swabs, not found and not found. So much as it might be attempting to think about uh, something transgenic involved in Morgellons, it's not agrobacterium that's doing it. So there's no fungi, it's no filarial worms, no arthropods, bacteria, okay, nothing that I had found so far, but I'll Tons of other people were finding Borrelia. Uh, initially, I freely admit I could not amplify Borrelia DNA. Uh, I took, uh, took actually when I finally got down to it and said, well, why is everybody else finding it and I'm not finding it? And I, one of my uh, um, undergraduate researchers actually ended up spending almost the entire summer designing primers and trying it and failing and trying and we just could not get it until finally, sure enough, got a set of primers that worked. And why they work for some people and not for other people, that's hard to say. Magnesium, the pH, is, we, we tried troubleshooting and it, it took, uh, yeah, there's, there's probably, um, probably, 800 hours, I would say, just in trying to get the primers to work for this at all. Uh, so, could be Borrelia, Borrelia subspecies. 
Now, I had Bartonella helicobacter and treponema there because when we were doing all that initial screening, I wasn't looking for specific bacteria. I was doing sort of this broad scatter approach of here are some primers that will amplify almost any bacterial DNA. And that, unfortunately, that means taking one a uh, little bit of amplified DNA and subcloning it into a whole bunch of different things and looking at each one of those, trying to figure out what these are. Very time consuming. And um, there were some little fragments of DNA that got amplified that didn't quite match but sort of looked like could have been Bartonella, uh, H. pylori maybe, and Treponema. A couple others that never did actually turn out to be anything. So the same strategy was used. I put the primers here for anyone who is interested in. Uh, these were uh, all 16S ribosomal units, except for the H. pylori, which was the urease gene, because it's uh, particularly novel for uh, H. pylori in that, that region. And sure enough, what we were finally amplifying turned out there was Borrelia. Uh, you can see the uh, matches, the top line of each, uh, across each line is the, what we sequenced and submitted, and then the subject uh, comes back and says what exactly the matches are. So this worked for Borrelia, for Bartonella hensley, H. pylori, and Treponema denticola. So just so you can see it as sort of a, a how close these things are to the uh, identity, which would be 100% if it was exactly identical. Um, all of these, 98, 99%. So another way of looking at it is, see this E value here? Uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 110th. So basically what that's saying is the odds that this is not Borrelia burgdorferi is 1 to the 0. Point put in 120 zeros. In other words, it is. There's no question about it. Uh, also the 98, 99% identity. Uh, could this be one of the other species of uh, Borrelia? Uh, these, these primers were specifically designed for Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, at that point, didn't really know that there were some other species that might be involved. So no, th these are actually specifically the Lyme causative agent. So in these lesions, uh, the samples, uh, I've just numbered them, one, two, three, four, and so forth. Uh, found Borrelia, Bartonella, H. pylori in the first lesion, in the second lesion. All four of the species were present. I'm just going to go through those quickly and put, show you on a table. This was uh, the uh, third through fifth samples of DNA, six through eighth. And here's what it eventually, when we, when we tallied it up, if you wanted to compare. They're not all the same. It would have been really nice if everyone would have been the same. Now, why do samples three and four not have Borrelia, but do have uh, in sample three all of the other species, sample four, uh, Bartonella and H. pylori? Uh, I have no clue. This was replicated multiple times because we kept thinking this doesn't make any sense. But for whatever reason, in, in these two particular samples, we just weren't able to amplify Borrelia. But they seem to be um, Morgellon samples. And in fact, the Bartonella hensley, uh, same with Bartonella. This is specific for this species of uh, Bartonella. It won't pick up the South American variety uh, or, or any of the others. Um, so every one of these Morgellon samples had at least two of these bacterial strains found, or species found. Some had three, uh, some had, had four. So at the time, I had a, I have, uh, whenever s students need to do something, uh, medical students for me, uh, in the way of research, and they have no actual skill set when it comes to being able to go in the lab and do something, um, I have them do literature searches, find out what's current. I am not an, a Lyme expert, but I'm curious about Lyme disease for obvious reasons. So I have them go and basically look up what they can about the debate between chronic Lyme versus the you know, post-Lyme treatment syndrome, or whatever it's called. 
And uh, basically, um, then they do a report to me. And they come to my office, they sit there, because uh, it's always fun to see what their, you know, uh, facial expressions are when they're, when they're dis describing this stuff. And just so you know, uh, you know, when, when we're talking to a, a medical student who uh, uh, mostly, mostly second years, uh, one was a uh, fourth year, who had done all his clinical rotations and just wanted to, you know, uh, have a slightly more chill month and so decided to come do this with me. Well, they're, they're not necessarily real clouded by things yet because uh, they, they know what we've taught them. They've experienced some things when they go through their clerkship rotations at the hospital or in, in rural clinics. Uh, in Oklahoma, a lot of our students go through what's called a rural track where they go to small clinics, offices, and um, hospitals scattered all across the state. But, but often they're, you know, they haven't been fully developed in terms of their biases about certain things. So that said, 100% of the medical students who have looked at the two different approaches have 100% come to the conclusion that post-Lyme treatment syndrome doesn't make any sense. And that chronic Lyme disease seems like, well, why wouldn't it exist if, it does, if you don't kill off all the bacteria? Because there are papers, and as has been mentioned, that uh, show that the doxycycline doesn't necessarily get all of the bacteria depending on the form that they're in and where they're at. So at any rate, um, oops. Uh, Students always ends up with Morgellons because of the link now. So when they're researching this, then they find out about Morgellons, or they already knew, knew about that because of, you know, watching something on YouTube that I was probably in, whether I wanted to be in or not. And um, so one of the questions was, are there different species of Borrelia in these populations? That's a good question. And, Probably the answer is yes, based on some of uh, the research I've heard. Um, but then there were a couple questions that I hadn't really thought of before. One was, do the bacteria cause the lesions, or are they somehow attracted to the lesions? Uh, that just never dawned on me, because I'm looking at it as purely a causative agent. <clears throat> Fortunately, I can't even think how one would try and answer that question as far as the being attracted to the lesions. So, I just kind of ignored that one. But then the other one just absolutely floored me because I had never thought of this. Are the same bacteria present in lesions also found in that patient's normal skin? Because in, in most, uh, most Morgellons sufferers, there will be areas that are, are in pretty bad shape, but then other areas that look relatively like normal skin. So. There are punch biopsies that uh, we have obtained, uh, samples that had been sent in, that were actually not too many, but a few of them that had been taken from normal skin as well as uh, the lesions. Now, one problem is that samples are de-identified when they come into the lab, but um, we're able to track down at least which ones were uh, linked together and what state they're from. Not who they're from or even what city, but the states are listed. So, in this match set, it had sample number one was from the right thigh of a person. Sample number two was punch biopsy from the right upper arm. And in each case, there was one of the punch biopsies that was from a border of the lesion, because, you know, pathologists love taking borders, the margins, right? They, they want to see, anyway, that, that's what they do. That's what they like. So, so, I guess that's useful for cancer in particular. But at any rate, uh, that's what all these were from the borders of a lesion. <coughs> and then also from uh, unaffected tissue from the thigh and from the um, right upper arm. So I used all the same primers to look at it, and 98, 99% again identity, so these are unquestionably what, what uh, the species that we were looking for. Oh, sorry, I thought I had the uh, table next, but obviously I don't. Uh, so from the, two, from the lesions here, uh, this is from New York, and from the lesions, Borrelia, Bartonella, and H. pylori, and Treponema, 
I was really excited. All four species were found in the lesion. However, in the non-lesion so-called normal tissue, only Borrelia was present. The next sample is from Colorado. And the lesions in this case didn't have everything, but they had Borrelia, Bartonella, and H. pylori. And the non-lesion tissue only had Borrelia present in it. So that first go around, this is what it looks like as far as the distribution. Uh, the non-L is the non-lesion tissue. Only Borrelia was present. Now, why does lesion one have treponema denticola and lesion number two not have that? Yeah, it wasn't there apparently. We'll just go with that. But, but maybe you can see where this, uh, this might be going. So the next one is from Washington State. And uh, let me go to the table because that's easier to, to see. From the first lesion, had three of the four present. Second lesion, again, it didn't have Borrelia present. But the non-lesion tissue did have Borrelia. Now, that makes no sense to me, but I'm just showing it to you because the data is what the data is, and this is, this is what we got. But what was, uh, you know, most interesting to me was just the fact that more than one variety of bacteria was present in all the lesions that we had looked at from, again, this is from the same person, uh, lesion and non-lesion tissue. Number four is from Oklahoma, of course. I had to have one from Oklahoma. Uh, Borrelia Bartonella H. pylori found in both lesions, only Borrelia in the non-lesions. So if I totaled all those up, there was one lesion, these are from the matched sets. For, so for the lesions, there was one that had all four varieties present, four of them that had three present, and then there was that one oddball that uh, didn't have Borrelia. But all six of the um, matched sets, the non-lesions, had Borrelia and none of the other bacteria present in it. So where am I going with that? Well, it seems like there's at least the possibility that it's worth exploring whether or not the change from a non-lesion state to a lesion state might involve more than one bacterial form is basically uh, what I, I think is certainly worth looking at in, in more detail. And so, you know, going back to the beginning now, thinking about the, the rationale I mentioned, what did I say in my mind when I was approaching this from way back at the beginning with no clue what might be going on? There should be a, if it's, if it's the biological explanation, that is to say there is a real patho pathology with an etiology that somehow involves microorganisms, that there would have to be novel organisms found in samples from those within the Morgellons community that are not commonly found in the unaffected population. So did we do that first part? Did we find some novel bacteria? Well, I certainly wasn't expecting to find H. pylori in, in skin samples, uh, being mostly associated with uh, ulcers. Yeah, there's, there's this paper that shows there might be some link with uh, rosacea, um, uh, with H. pylori. But uh, just in general, it's not something that typically is found in, uh, in skin. So in doing tallying up everything, there's what we had. There are 32 total samples that we looked at with, from of Morgellons uh, samples, specifically with these four primer sets. And the way it shook out with the 32 is shown here. There were five samples, had all four, seven that had three of the four. Anyway, you can go down the list. There were, uh, you know, the two sort of, the, the three outliers that did not have Borrelia present in them. There was actually one sample um, that only had H. pylori present in it and, and none of the other, of the three bacterial. So I think that, okay, was not expecting to find those found them there. Let's look at the other half of what's necessary. Has to be found in the majority, if not all of the Morgellons population, but not in the background population. So, I was able to go to a local pathology lab and get some uh, leftover punch biopsies. 
for various things, uh, acne, cancer, just punch biopsies for whatever reason, the, the physician had ordered it to be uh, looked at by the pathologist. And out of seven samples, there's how common any of these bacteria are in the background population. That's uh, zero across the board, but all seven of those did have the positive control bacteria, the uh, Staphylococcus variety that I was looking at. All seven of these samples came up a very bright band with that. So it's suggesting that the DNA was not bad. These are just not found there. So as far, and then I also had just to see how prevalent in the, in the environment it is. You know, since treponema and H. pylori are associated with the stomach, with the mouth, uh, is it easy, can you cough, uh, sneeze, put it on door handles, uh, on your skin? So I had a few people, you know, coughing all over their arms and doing swabs to see if it would, we could amplify it. Uh, students went around to, before the, uh, Cleaning staff came in about four o'clock in the afternoon and swabbed all the elevator buttons, the restroom doorknobs, the um, uh, toilet handles, and uh, actually could never amplify it from anything as far as uh, trep uh, the, the T. denticola or the, the H. pylori. So I, I was, um, before, I, before I left on, you know, I, w I was discussing what I was going to try and do when I was uh, talking here today. And so I was using uh, one of my daughter's four dogs as uh, the audience. And <laughs> I, I'm not kidding you. He was laying there just watching. And all of a sudden, he rolled over onto his back and went to sleep on me. That's Mr. Darcy, one of the rescue dogs. So, this is what I've actually concluded. The Morgellons disease samples are in fact associated with microorganisms not found in the unaffected population. Since it's 100% of the Morgellons samples and 0% of the unaffected population samples, what does the research suggest? Just as was pointed out yesterday, uh, throw out the window of the purely psychiatric hypothesis and I went with Morgellons is a condition associated with microbial agents and any behavioral or psychiatric symptoms are likely a consequence of the infection or from stressors that are associated with any chronic disease, which doesn't always get mentioned, but it happens in any chronic disease state, or both. So, delusional or not delusional? Well, I could be referring to me based on some of the comments that um, it, it's uh, as a scientist, I go with evidence. So the question is, does this prove Morgellons is a, a real pathology that's associated with a biological agent? Well, keep in mind, I'm not a physician. I'm a scientist. And the term proof is used in a very um, specific way. Uh, we're, we're really good at disproving things. So in my mind, I, dis, I proved that some of those other organisms are not the cause of Morgellons disease, because they're not present. Uh, proof, though, you know, that's sort of in the eye of the beholder. I mean, if you look at, uh, does HIV cause AIDS? It's generally accepted. But at what point can you go to a specific paper and say, well, this was the proof? Rather, it was a body of work that was research that was done. And gradually, the medical community came to accept that that is the likely causative agent for AIDS. That tends to be more the way it works. There's not this one, bam, this is the proof. It can happen, but it's a fairly rare thing. So in my mind, is it proof? Absolutely. At the very least, I think any physician who could see those results should at the very least be willing to say, wow, there are bacteria found in this person that are not found in people who don't have this condition. Let's see what we can do about the treatment. 
that's at the very least. Thank you. Here are my references. I do have a bunch. You wouldn't be interested in them. Uh, my acknowledgments. The president of the Center for Health Sciences has been supportive of me. My associate dean, my department chair, Holman Foundation, Cindy Casey, of course. Uh, Holman is the uh, person who I have uh, dealt with the most of all. Everyone researching Morgellons. And I, I was avoiding eye contact, but Dr. Smith there, as someone I've known for many, many years and is a, a good friend. Thank you very much. <laughs>